I was approached uh, on this subject quite a while back, and I finally got around to it. Unfortunately, none of this is uh, real time, uh, so I've, uh, I'm not going to be taking questions to show you how to do something specifically, but I wanted to go over this a little bit. Um, the options that you have, there's quite a few options, and uh, I know quite a few people that do logging very differently than I do, so there's no one right answer to what works for you. Uh, so basically, the topics are what, why do we need logging? Because nowadays, uh, it's not a requirement by uh, ISED to log your contacts. It, we'll see that it, it actually integrates so many different things on your um, in your in your shack. A lot of hardware. Another good thing about logging is a lot of it is free, and hams tend to like free. So uh, what I'm going to show you today is um, is also a um, a lot of freeware, uh, and talk about the five uh, free packages that are the highest rated according to um, eham.net, and give you a little summary at the end. So getting on with the why logging, there's really what I came up with is like five good reasons to do this even though it's not specifically required anymore. Uh, the first thing is, I mentioned integration. You can have the logging software talk to a bunch of different hardware and control things all through the one piece of software. Uh, one that I will mention also that I know um, Amir uses a lot, uh, you pay a one-time fee, so it's not free, but Ham Radio Deluxe, uh, has logging built in and it does a lot of these things. Plus it has more um, more options and things it can do than a lot of the free ones because they're actually making some money on it or at least getting reimbursed. <clears throat> but talking to your rig through what's called CAT or um, CAT control, uh, you can actually um, have it set up. So if you have a, a rotator that reads your band data, whatever, you're talking to Japan, it'll rotate your Yagi uh, to the proper uh, heading. Uh, it can generate CW, digital modes, some of these logging programs have built-in or third-party uh, applications. So there's a lot of good reason to have logging just to get everything talking to itself or to each other. Um, keeping track of the QSOs, this is the traditional um, reason for logging and the old paper log books and whatever. And you could write notes and you could uh, keep track of your QSLs and who you sent cards to and who you've uh, sent um, eQSLs to or logbook of the world, digital QSLs to and so on. So there's all kinds of record keeping. Um, and that comes in handy if you're looking for awards and certificates and that sort of thing. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. A band map. A lot of these applications have what's called a band map, and I'll show you if you're new to this, I'll show you what that looks like. And uh, these interface with what are called spotting clusters. People will uh, work a station or they'll hear a station <clears throat> and post them on the internet into a cluster and if your station is set up your logging software is set up to receive that information it'll post it so right away you'll see that 3y0j is spotted at uh, this frequency by so and so and uh and they're doing cw or they're doing ft8 or whatever so right and you click on them and your radio goes right to that frequency in the old days you had to hunt around and Maybe a, a buddy would call you on the phone or two meters and tell you that there's a, there's a good DX station on. Uh, managing your awards, keeping track of, uh, we call them countries. Uh, the ARRL really calls them entities because like Alaska is not a country or Hawaii, whatever. They're separate entities. I think Alberta should be a separate entity, but uh, oh well. Anyway, um, so if you want your DXCC, you can manage that, all different bands, different modes, 
Uh, and your logging software can actually help you color code what you need, what you've worked and what you still need. And I'll show that, uh, examples of that. I uh, worked all states, worked all continents, whatever. So um, these are all things you can manage. And then uh, there's a data exchange format, which everybody uses pretty much. It's called uh, ADIF. And um, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but you can um, store all your information in a flat file and then upload it to different logging software, which comes in handy, uh, depending on what software you're using. For example, if you want to upload your um, your log, if, it's, if you're using Logger32, like I do, and you want to upload it to Logbook of the World to work towards uh, certificates from the ARRL, you just export it in AVIF format and import it uh, into the LOTW, and it's very uh, straightforward. In fact, a lot of these logging programs have uh, the capability of going right into LOTW or EQSL or some of the other ones immediately, so you don't even have to do that, anything. Um, and finally, integrating with third-party software. So, for example, you want to do FT8. I've got it integrated with Logger32 so that it actually shows me what grid squares I need by a color code. <clears throat> I collect grid squares from around the world, and uh, it'll come up as a, uh, a green grid square or something. I say, oh, that's a new one. So I'll try to work the guy. And then uh, it automatically, once I get a Roger Roger 73 from the guy in FT8, it automatically goes into Logger 32's database as well, and then checks off that I've got that grid square. Uh, L32 Lookup is a third-party program by uh, November 2 Alpha Mike Golf, and it looks up the call sign that you type into your uh, logging window or you that gets in there one way or another it, it could be clicking on them on the band map it comes in there and automatically looks them up on qrz.com and populates a little box in the logger 32 that tells you their name and their qth and a few other things about them so all this can come together all this information can be uh in sort of one stop shopping uh, location in your shack with a good logging program. Any questions up to this point? Sherry, is there any benefit to using multiple logging tools? Yes, yes. And I'll, we'll, we'll come to that very quickly, actually. It's a good question. So these are the, the five programs that were highest rated uh, that were free in uh in eham uh and just as you asked that question club log really to me is not a logging program it's what you upload your logs to to see what you need in terms of uh, uh certificates or uh, goals that you're working towards plus it has some other advantages too which we'll talk about shortly there's another one by this italian ham called Log4OM, which stands for Logging for Old Men or Old Man. Um, it, it sounds like a movie title almost. But anyway, it's actually quite a good program. It's free, and it gets a higher rating than Logger32. A few years ago, a buddy of mine was, was really pissed off with Logger32. It had some really nasty bugs in it, and he went for Log4OM and was able to... Uh, upload his log in ADIF format, or ADI format, I guess, and uh, and he really liked log 4OM, so, um, and he never looked back, so it's definitely something you, you may want to look at, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, Logger32 is what I use. Um, they have a really good, um, well, actually, here in Calgary, we had one of the beta testers. Uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, uh, Jerry uh, V6LB. So if I ever had a question about it, I uh, contact him and he usually had a good answer. Uh, I don't know if he's still doing that or not. I know he's had some health issues, so uh, he may not be uh, doing that uh, right right now. But 
Logger 32 has a lot of features and it's quite complex, but they have uh, a good groups IO uh, group as well. You can ask questions. And I'll be spending most of my time here tonight talking about that. N1MM Logger uh, was written by N1MM and he's a real contester. And most, uh, it's the most popular contesting logging program there is. Uh, not necessarily the best, but um, it's still gaining uh, market share, even though it's free. Um, and this is one I've used for contests. And what I normally do is I take my log once I'm done the contest and I help, I'll put the ADI format and bring it into Logger32. So I have one complete log of every contact I've ever made. And one of the things you can do in Logger32 is you can, uh, it has a contest field in the database, so you can tell it what contest uh, you're importing. So if you ever want to look up ARRL DXCW 2004, you can find that in there and see all your contacts. And finally, there's WinLog32, which is a real bare bones thing. I think that one is from the UK, um, but uh, it has some uh, advantages as well that we'll talk about. So a lot of it has to do, it's kind of like the car you drive, you start driving one make and you like it or you don't, and uh, you end up eventually with sort of a preferred um, uh, manufacturer or type of vehicle that you like, and you keep going with it. And so uh, once you kind of get into it, you stick with it, I think is is pretty much the case. Okay, let's move on to club log. So club log, you you can, uh, you have to um, join this. There's no restriction or whatever. And you can put in your call signs here, uh, V6TL, my previous call sign, which I still have as well, CNU, before I got my two letter call in 2009. And my very first call, the 3 hcn when I was 16. So I've got all that and I still had my records uh, from way back when. So anyway, and you can see uh, it's got a list of all the entities that are recognized by the uh, ARRL and whether you've worked them or what band. And C is confirmed, a green C, a uh, yellow with a W as you worked but not confirmed. And Y is uh, granted, I think is a or is that, no, V is verified. Okay, verified is the same as what ARL would call granted. So, uh, and that's another topic for getting things uh, okayed or approved in, in the ARL. One of the nicer things about Club Log is if you're trying to work a de-expedition, you can check if you're in their log. And a lot of these de-expeditions have real-time or near real-time logging though upload their logs every day or once a day or something like that. Unfortunately, uh, Bouvet is not in a position to do that, but if they if they were, you could check on here and they uh, this is where they would upload their log to this site. And then you could see if you've actually worked them and they would show you the bands and modes that you've worked them on. And then you could look for your, your buddies to see if, if they've worked them and how many times, how many modes so that you can try to compete with some of your uh, your DX buddies, that sort of thing. So that's that's sort of the you the main uses of Club Log. There's one more thing that they also do, which if you're into collecting QSL cards, they have a uh, something called OQRS, the Online QSL Request Service. In the old days, and still to some extent, but it's getting less. You would send a few uh, what they call green stamps or U.S. dollar bills, two or three dollars in the mail with a, a self-addressed envelope and to a foreign country, like you'd send it to Egypt or to India or Saudi Arabia, wherever, with the hope that um, you'd get a QSL card back in the mail someday. They, if you're really a old timer, you remember IRCs, the International Reply Coupons, which I don't think are done anymore in Canada. But that would you would buy one IRC and it would be worth a first class postage. 
and they charged you like five dollars or something and you get a dollar something worth of postage out of it so <laughs> there wasn't much value in it anyway uh it was really popular with the Japanese and they they probably send up more cards than anyone uh, I still got a box full of IRCs I don't know what to do with but anyway uh OQRS saves you all that hassle you want a QSL card from a D expedition I like to have one from every country I have a album and I keep them in and uh and so you uh put uh go on to their OQRS site and you put in your um information when you work them what the station call sign was and when you work them what whatever and it matches them up and if you want a QSL card it tells you well it's three and 3.5 euros typically or maybe three euros or four whatever's um uh francs or whatever so you just say okay and then you send it sends you on to uh PayPal or whatever and then they get your request and probably within two or three weeks you get your card in the mail so you don't have to gamble that you sent two or three U.S. dollars and then it never you never get the card because someone saw that in the mail and took the money out and threw the rest away that was quite often probably at least half of uh the cards I sent out uh ended up that way so through club log you can get paper cards from exotic countries and that sort of thing pretty reliably questions okay log for old man yeah yeah this one looks pretty good and I might recommend it you know for those who are starting because it's got uh it has quite a, a lot of interesting information on there um for example the guy he's you can see he's working split right now there's uh two different frequencies uh the transmit or sorry the receive probably and then the transmit is up three kilohertz and uh he's trying to work this guy in Italy so it automatically puts the Italian flag next to it and then um it finds this information from QRZ and populates these fields automatically and then shows you a map of the world with the gray line and so on on it and then it shows you here on the right Italy all the different bands and modes that he's already this person has already worked Italy so for example 80 meter phone he's he's made a contact now it doesn't necessarily show you which he's confirmed or worked I don't know maybe there's a, a color code here I don't know that much about it and it shows you his QSL card probably through eQSL right away so you can download an eQSL card and print it if you wanted and uh and which ones he's oh here's the bands and confirmed and worked on the left bottom left so a lot of information this looks like Google Maps uh with a grid square in it so his grid square um is right here JN65EO so it's actually plotted out it's a rectangle and there it is in the green box down here again and uh, this is where he's located relative to the center of the grid square so the very center of all grid squares the last uh two characters would be MM Mike Mike in the middle so he's EO he's down here anyway so there and, and this is the band map part of it so this is a pretty cool looking program it even has some uh, solar indices and that sort of thing uh and sunrise sunset for Italy so it looks like a pretty cool uh GUI for uh for logging now How does this know if you've confirmed a contact well you would have to tell it uh, oh okay okay so it's not going over the internet and asking the other fellow hey did you hear them or not no that's a good question so what I do uh for example uh and we'll get to logger 32 but uh once a month usually the first day of the month or thereabouts I export my ADI uh formatted file and I upload it to LOTW 
And usually within a couple hours, it, it processes that. And then I get onto their website, the LOTW, and I download in ADI format all the confirmations. And then I synchronize that with Logger32. And now it knows which ones are confirmed. So I would assume a similar thing would happen here. Now, there are uh, some that actually some logging programs that actually go out to LOTW and pull that information in right away. So there's some automation there. I don't know if this one does it or not. Okay, so let's move on to Logger32. This is what my screen looks like. I will point out that it's very customizable. Uh, and so you can arrange your fields in the in the uh, windows however you want by dragging and dropping them in a in a menu uh, that I'm not showing here but this is the way I have it organized um, and so let's just talk about some of these uh, features here so the band map uh, tells you I'm on 40 meters and you can have multiple band maps and it gets pretty complicated I like to just see everything on one but the CW is down on the bottom and then you get 7.074. These clustered together would be FT8. And then you go up above 7,100 here and you're starting to get into the phone uh, lower sideband. So this, and if you click on one of these stations, like I clicked on N9W somewhere uh, down here, uh, then it populates the input window uh, immediately, and then it goes into the QRZ lookup because I've got this thing configured to go into QRZ, pull out this information, and it populates some of the fields. Like it finds his first name Scott, so it puts Scott in here, uh, and it, and then it also grabs the grid square, and it puts it in here. And it tells you where to point your antenna, the short path and long path, they're 180 degrees apart. Uh, and it tells you how many miles, or you could specify kilometers if you want. So 1,099 miles away. So right away, I have a lot of information uh, about this. And it tries to guess by the call sign prefix, November 9, it thinks, well, it's most likely in sh around Chicago. So it tells you that down here. He's actually in Wisconsin. So uh, the United States is one of the few countries where the prefix no longer uh, uh, belongs to the location. If you had this call sign, you can move around the country and keep your call sign. In Canada, if, if you're in Alberta, you're a VA or VE6, um, unless you get spe special dispensation from ISED or uh, I, I'm not sure if it's RAC, to uh, get a special call sign for a contest or something. But we would get, like, I think Sugar Victor is for the, the, um, the WPX coming up. They're going to be v Victor Charlie 6 X-Ray, I think. Anyway, uh, so that, and then if you type N9W in there or click on him, one more thing also happens automatically it finds them in the previous QSOs and tells you all the different bands and modes that you worked them on. Now notice in here that all of these contacts have a sort of a salmon color in the background. That tells me that I have not exported these contacts to LOTW. Once I do that, it becomes a white background. So I know that I've still got work to do at the end of the month or beginning of the month to get all these um, exported, and it will only export the ones that are flagged automatically. When I make a new contact, it's pink, until I actually export them. And then it says, do you want to update all the contacts that you tell it that you've exported them all? And I say yes, and then they all turn white. There was a uh, contest for the month of January when this was going on uh, for WRTC, that's the Ham Radio Olympics, and all these different stations had the prefix W, you'll see in my law, or sorry, the suffix W, or WRTC in different countries. So I was trying to work as many of these as I could, 
and it had real time logging for them, I could go on a, a website and see just how many uh, stations I worked for the month of January. It's over now. And out of 109,000 stations in the contest, I ended up number 1530. So I did pretty good on that. Uh, worked about 150 state, uh, 150 contacts in the, in the month of January all over the world. The other thing that uh, goes on uh, here, um, there's this local host. And so I mentioned uh, spotting networks or spotting clusters. So uh, I can go in here and uh, local host, and you can see down in the bottom here, VE7CC. He has a website and a web page that, that hosts um, uh, the cluster information. And so when I subscribe to him, I have to log in here in this window and with uh, my call sign and right away to start scrolling and these spots come up. And if I send a message in this local host window, uh, show me all the, the last 50 DX spots, this thing starts moving and I see all these different call signs. And then if there's something I need, it puts a little dot in the map on the left side. I can even click on a, the spot on the map and it'll take me to that station uh, the frequency and whatever. So it's all very interactive. Um, and then of course, N9W is a US station. And so in the bottom right corner, it shows me all the bands and modes that I've worked US stations. But if it was uh, Germany, it would show me all the stations and bands and modes I'd uh, worked Germany. So it gives you a lot of information right away. Now, um, on the top, there's a whole bunch of icons in here, and this gives you additional capabilities. I'm not going to mention too many of them, but here you can see it looks like a, a Morse key. You can actually uh, use this as a keyboard to type in Morse, and it'll send Morse through your radio as well, which I sometimes do, or RTTY and so on. Um, and so there's a bunch of different things that you can add in here. Um, and then down on the bottom, there's also other things, data terminal. Uh, you can do this with two radios. So this is, I'm on radio one. I don't have it set up for two radios. I don't have a rotator in here. You can attach, uh, I have it talk to a TNC, Telnet. I don't have the, that one on it the, uh, well, when I took this picture, but I sometimes use Telnet for the, the spots. Um, you can have automatic antenna switching if you want to do that. Um, digital voice keyer, so you can record your voice and have it play your voice. If you want to call CQ or whatever, you can uh, set that up. Micro ham, that's a, uh, a way of uh, electronic keyer uh, for CW. And then it's got TCP and UDP for, um, for different protocols for connecting through your computer. And the UDP is what you use to connect to FT8. And so I use that and you specify the, um, the port and uh, in WSJT you give it, or JT, uh, whatever it's called, um, you, you can specify what port you want it to talk to uh, uh, through UDP to the, to, to the uh, logger 32 and it will automatically log your uh, FT8 in here as well or any of those digital modes that you can do in WSJT. So it's a lot of stuff and it even shows you uh, so your solar flux or whatever. Okay, setting it up, there's been some questions as to do how to do this. I use um, a pan adapter um, and um, uh, Larry Phipps, uh, N8LP uh, wrote this software for multiple or virtual uh, COM ports. It's called LP Bridge. This is ver uh, Bridge 2 version, whatever. And so I actually set this up. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here, but my rig is a Yesu FT5000, so I can select that. NAP3 is the software that I'm using for my PAN adapter. It's free shareware, and uh, it has the waterfall and spectrum display. And this creates a, a virtual port, uh, COM99, that I specified here. 
And my rig, uh, my Yesu 5000, is actually on COM 11. And so I've got that. This this um, is from the, the logger 32 window. I set that up through my FT5000. And so I, I can actually have uh, the pan adapter display going with logger 32 um, uh, this way with these virtual ports. When I run N1MM, I uncheck these COM11 and I go to COM12 and that runs uh, automatically. It will load this program, uh, auto launch and run N1MM with, with, uh, uh, with the pan adapter, not with logger 32. So like most things, getting the COM ports straight is probably the hardest part getting set up. Um, for the uh, CW machine in Logger32, I use uh, COM port 5, and then, um, so it's set up here, COM 5, and uh, so I can type in like uh, this and save this as a, my CQDX button, and then it will automatically send this out through COM port 5, which uh, keys my rig uh, through my, uh, I have a sound blaster box that, that handles the com ports too so it all works pretty well and then the dxcc chart this is in logger 32 so for example i've worked countries that's the w i've confirmed them myself and then when i upload them to logger the logbook of the world uh, and they confirm them and you have to pay i think eight cents each uh, for various uh to confirm them, uh, then you get uh, the uh, G, which is granted. So then um, uh, out of the current countries, there's 340 countries. I've worked 325, 324 confirmed because I just worked uh, Crozet and um, 315 I've applied for so far. So I, I could apply for another 10 now, um, but I'm gonna wait. I, you need, I think, uh, 331 to get on the honor roll. So I'm six away from the honor roll, which is what you get, you can get listed in the QST magazine as the honor roll. Uh, and you can see the different numbers of uh, countries I work by band. I'm halfway there on 160 meters. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but uh, that would be for nine band DXCC. And I just started working uh, 60 meters with a QCX mini and a little uh, amplifier for 25 watts on uh, 60 meter CW. So it's got a long way to go on that one. But it keeps track of all that for you and color codes what you need when it shows you the band map. For worked all states, uh, I'm not showing all the states, but you can see how many. I still need one more state on 17 meters. I, don't, I guess it's uh, Delaware. Never talk to Delaware on 17 meters and so on. And these are confirmed, whatever. Um, grid squares, and uh, you can see what you worked in. This is for the entire world. So I'm, I'm over 2,400 now, uh, which is a lifetime. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's always fun to find a new one. So uh, moving on integrating with uh, WSJT. Uh, so here is uh, WSJT X on the top left and top right. And uh, if you're not doing uh, doing that, uh, uh, I have another little presentation afterwards, which describes a little more because we've had some questions on that. I don't know if I have time tonight or not, but we'll see. Um, and so again, uh, here on the right hand side, in bright red are the, well, this column is the uh, grid square. And this red uh, box came around it because I needed that grid square. I'd never talked to this guy in uh, this grid square in China before. BG, I can't read it, BG6PYY. And there it is. Oh yeah, you can see it in here. So um, he's in OM75. And so I needed that. So I called him. And I finally got through to this guy and there's his report to me. And so now I, I worked this guy 
and I got the grid square. Um, this is another example. Um, okay, the reason I showed this one is I, I mentioned before that all my new contacts go in as pink. This was right after I up, updated uh, Logbook of the World. And then when I downloaded all the co confirmed contacts, they all come in as highlighted red through the line. So that means these are all confirmations. The white ones I haven't got confirmed. So that's another thing that the software shows you. And then um, this is, so that's it for Logger 32 for now. N1MM logger, you may have seen this if you've done a contest with, with Kara or somewhere else. Um, it's probably, to my way of thinking, one of the best contesting uh, applications. And so you have your main logging window. And this was during the um, uh, North American CUSO party last month. And uh, you exchange your first name and your state or your province. And you try to work as many other people. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, this one was, I believe, 12 hours uh, maximum for one person or 10 hours. And so it shows you all the, the, uh, the states. Uh, they're a brevi two letter abbreviation, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, and so on, and all the different bands that you work them on. And you get a blue square for each one that you work them on. And then it, gives you your score by band, uh, multipliers, and so on. And you get a score at the end of this. And so this is my, uh, my pen adapter display that I integrate on my screen um, through that um, uh, virtual COM port, LPB2 I showed you earlier. And uh, when I work, you know, I can click on this, uh, this station here. This I see a peak, I can click on him and it will uh, send me right to that frequency and I can figure out who I'm working. Now, there's nothing on the band map here because I did it without any assistance. It's a different category. But if I had assistance, I could use the spotting and I'll be able to click on stations and it would send me right to that frequency and so I could work them. It also gives you rates, how many stations you're working per hour. We call it queues per hour and so on. So N1MM is, is uh, pretty robust uh, and, and it even helps you. This is called a partial check. When you're typing in a guy's call sign, it gives you all the possibilities that it could be in case you're having trouble hearing them. Um, so if I put in VE6T, uh, if people have worked in contests, a TA, a TN, TC, it'll show you those. Uh, so people actually upload their logs to a central website and that goes into the master uh, check master uh, database which you can then download and in, into and uh, import into uh, n1mm <clears throat> and there's even a history file so if you type in a guy's call sign <clears throat> it'll tell you his name unfortunately a lot of people uh, aren't consistent so it, it might tell you bob you and you see Bob and, and you listen to his, uh, his uh, exchange and he says he's Fred. So you have to pay attention. It's not always accurate. So that's N1MM. And then when I'm done the contest, I, I go into file and export ADI format and I import it into Logger32. This is uh, WinLog32. Um, and it's... Uh, kind of a bare bones, but the nice thing about it is it will work on some really old hardware, even if you've got Windows 95, uh, supposedly it's still supported for that. So if you've got an old computer or whatever and you still wanna use it for logging, uh, you can, and uh, it keeps track of a lot of stuff. I don't know much more than that about it, not really uh, done anything with it, but uh, it did get a good rating in Eham, so it's out there. And I just wanted to include that as another option. So to summarize, uh, logging is not just logging. It can be an integral part of your station, uh, keeps track of all kinds of stuff. 
I can talk to all kinds of hardware and integrate that together. And it's a great place for um, uh, communicating with us, other software, other uh, things like awards, uh, LOTW, and so on. There's a lot of uh, different ways of QSLing and so on. Now, I have a, a friend, uh, Terry, the 4EA, and he doesn't use any of this. He uses LOTW directly. So when he uh, he works a station, it automatically goes into uh, Logbook of the World. I don't know how he knows um, which ones he needs, but uh, that's that's what he's chosen to do. So different people do different things. That's great. Um, but I'm just showing you that I found Logger 32 pretty reliable. It does have its glitches every now and then, uh, but they're pretty good at, at uh, addressing those and coming up with a new uh, a new version uh, if it's if it's serious. So uh, any questions? Jerry, when you use N1MM, um, how does uh, Logger 32 know what you've worked? It doesn't. In fact, um, until recently, you could not run uh, the two together. They would conflict with each other. Now, I think if, and especially if you loaded Logger 32 first and then tried running N1MM, it wouldn't work. If you run N1MM first, I think you can now run Logger 32. Um, but they may conflict. So what I do is I do my contest. And then when I'm done, I export everything and put it into Logger 32. That way it knows everything. So this, um, yeah, you talked about, uh, you know, what the most difficult thing is. I mean, all of these uh, logging programs are so rich that uh, if there's newbies in the, here that are getting going with it, um, I really advise you get a template from somebody that you know, and uh, because you've got customized columns and and colors and all sorts of things, and the the defaults in any of these is just not easy to follow. But um, you know, uh, uh, another really issue that I see here is uh, maybe you might make a comment on how you um, handle your databases. Uh, do you make a new database for every contact uh, or every contest? You do have to in N1MM. But your main day-to-day -day logging, do you have a new um, database uh, for every year, or how do you handle that? Good question. Um, in N1MM, I've used the same database ever since I started uh, uh, logging and contesting in 2004, 2005. And in Logger32, I've used the same database ever since I started there as well. In fact, what Logger32 did a couple of years ago, they came out with version 4.0 and they changed the internal database uh, to a different engine so that you could have over a million contacts in your database. Uh, some people were actually running up against that uh, limitation. I, I've got something like 80,000 or whatever contacts, but um, I've never had to change uh, that database. Now what I do in, um, I go back to uh, Logger32 window, you see these two icons here under the file. Uh, what, the first one is to, uh, art, is to um, save your database so that you can export it and, and archive it. So that if anything, uh, and zip your database. So you can save that and um, if something goes wrong, it's all archived. The other one, this uh, icon next to it is to uh, archive and zip all your uh, configuration files in case you lose that. And you can store that in a, in a separate place so that you can always uh, recover that. And, and once every month or two, I, I do a backup of all this stuff to another drive, but I've never had to uh, start all over from scratch in, in this. And so, and in N1MM, you use you always use the same database, but you use um, a new. Uh, there's an option new contest in database, mm -hmm. so it remembers all your personal information, your call sign, um, your grid square, and all that kind of stuff. 
but for each contest it's 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 starting over in its own sort of internal database but it's part of the the master database yeah that's one thing you have to get your head around because i wasn't sure if those contests were new databases or just a contest in it so even getting your head around some of that takes uh takes a little while yeah um you you basically start out and and start poking around and seeing um what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and then asking questions and looking at the help and it's just but you're right there's a lot of complexity and so uh depending what you want to do it can be it can be uh, a little uh intimidating at first but i mean you look at the the database here and you've got your date and if you click on the top of any of these fields it'll sort that particular field so your log will if you wanted to sort uh by call sign it'll <laughs> alphabetize your entire log uh or by frequency you'll start out with the lowest frequency and so on some of these are not very useful but um i obviously have it uh, sorted the most recent is on the bottom here and so uh on for example my uh, qrz page when i'm done updating for the month i take that um uh, i also update that page and you can see my most recent contacts over the past month uh from from the you know chronologically from this database goes into there as well one other comment i might make is that um you mentioned look up in QRZ. Um, that does require a subscription, at least at a minimal level, in order to do a lookup there. Um, uh, also on Ham Radio Deluxe, uh, it is a one-time fee of $100 US, but that's really only good for 12 months um, updates anyway. After that, I don't know what the renewal fees are on there and one other comment i was going to make is that um the highest reviews really don't reflect the number of users i think uh i'm looking at the uh, uh eham uh, review page and sorted by number of reviews and it starts out with 509 on logbook of the world hr deluxe is 451 and ac log which is fairly popular is 208 uh, DX Labs Wheat is 177, um, uh, and uh, uh, Logger 32 is down to 69, but I don't think that reflects the number of people using it. Obviously, um, N1MM is probably used by more people than any other program. So, But anyway, um, AC Log and DX Labs Wheat, DX Lab is the one that I'm using, and uh, those are extremely popular. So that's just another comment. Is there a fee for DX Labs? uh nope not solve free and it is modular it does it has a dx keeper it has a separate um, kind of a digital interface it has um uh i think three or four modules that you can launch separately or whatever and uh, it's a little more flexible when you have multiple monitors and you want to move stuff around and windows that kind of stuff so anyway i, I loaded up about five of these and i i tried log 4 om and i was not it, it just seemed restrictive and uh I don't know it's more of a, a kind of a european or continental way of thinking there so uh, i kind of liked ac log and uh, and really did uh, really really do like a logger 32 and dx lab suite so in my mind those are the top two okay so, so jerry <clears throat> when you work uh, ft8 uh, this uh, lower left that's pretty much all you have like to track who's calling who's calling you you know and uh so what I what I have on this screen here, uh, well, no, this is a standard. You know, yeah. this is the worker B, right? This is WSJTX. Right. But you know, just uh, you know, that massive call signs. Uh, the only uh, thing that helps you to distinguish who is on the air is just down here, where it says twenty meters FT eight, right? And uh, well, the call signs are listed here with you know right. the, the signal strength yeah i'm just you know i'm, I'm using a um what's it called the grid tracker yeah it's uh, just you know i'm just thinking it's a little better than that you know it's a, gives you more information yeah that's that's a separate 
application for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's another way of doing it. This shows you um, these two windows here are, are band maps. These are part of Logger 32. So it's actually populated. It, you, you watch uh, the 15 seconds go by. These uh, call signs all scroll through, and then you see it populate mm -hmm. this, this box here. And if anybody's calling me, they're on the left box. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I like this is I can instantly see if I need any of these, because if they're a new country or a new grid square, something new for that band, uh, there's a color code that goes with it. Okay, okay. I understand that. Okay, thanks. So Jerry, question for you. Um, so, you know, you're you're naming a number of different options. And of course, everybody here is going to try one and go, man, maybe I don't like that one. And, you know, try the next one and so on and so forth. Um, what's a typical way or best way, for example, if you are going to switch from, you know, one logging program to another, to not have to re-enter all of your log entries, right? Is there a common way to like export yes all yes. of your contacts and then import them into something else and you know that way you can kind of kick some tires and uh you know use all of them if you i guess you know until you settle on the one you like exactly well that's the adi format and so every one of these programs has the option and you go under file unfortunately this isn't live here but you'd say file export and uh, gives you your options um, and ADI and there's uh, and it's a standardized format uh, and then you uh, export that file and it has an extension of .ADI and then you go to your new uh, program and you uh, key in your call sign and whatever it requires for startup and then you say import log and you're away you go. Okay. Now, do you ever run into problems where, like, the field names or column names differ and they don't match up? No, because part of the format tells you, uh, like, it's, um, I don't have an example easily here, but the ADI format actually has, like, the less than and greater than signs around each field, and it tells the, uh, the next, like, there's a descriptor for each field, and so it reads the descriptor it says this, uh, the, the uh, QTH is 20 characters. And so, and then it expects 20 characters. And then the next field comes in and so on. So it, it actually is self-identifying all the fields that are in it. And so it's a very uh, easily understood format if you want to actually go and look at it yourself, uh, you know, edit a file. So it's, it's uh, I've never had a problem importing uh, uh, ADI format. Great, thank you. Um, another uh, another interchange is via Logbook of the World if you're using that. So uh, if you have a program and you've uploaded everything or from the beginning of time, you've got all your stuff in Logbook of the World, most logging programs allow you to download from it and then that would repopulate your program. I don't know if you get all the information, but it's another way to do it. Pretty close. They have two different uh, levels of verbosity uh, in the download. So you can download a standard format and the extended and then a super extended. So if you've got a lot of detail in there from LOTW, you can capture most of it. So having a uploaded database, fairly current database into LOTW or EQSL is another one. Uh, is like uh, a backup by itself. You can always recover because you can export that as ADI format and bring that into any logging program. Another thing that maybe should be mentioned to the group is um, specialized logging. And uh, I don't know if uh, Ken is still here. Don't know what he's using for um, soda stuff, but there are uh, you know specialized logging programs for those kinds of things. So. That's something else that should be mentioned anyway. Thanks for the segue, uh, Peter. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. 85% um, of my logging is soda. And of course, POTA is also growing in popularity. And uh, worldwide flora and fauna and all that. And 
A lot of these logging programs don't have either input fields that you need, like the SOTA summit reference, or they don't have a specific uh, export format that includes uh, the, the format that, for example, the SOTA website's looking for. Some of them do have that. And, uh, and I think some of them like AC log are sort of like uh, configurable to do that. So it might be worth the money for me to, to go with something like that. I noticed some of the ones like Logger 32 there had a field for uh, IOTA, probably because when it was built, that was, you know, the first and only kid on the block. But now, you know, soda is huge compared to IOTA. And uh, it'd be nice to see more of those specialty formats. A Logger 32 oh. has, has a, a soda um, uh, category for keeping track. Ah, it does not have a POTA yet. Okay. Oh, Ken, look at, I put it in the chat. It's called HAMRS, H-A-M-R-S. Yeah. Works on Windows, works on Mac, works on portable devices and stuff like that. I've started to use that for POTA. And I'll tell you what, it kicks butt. Um, it, it, if you're connected, you know, on your mountaintop or uh, at your POTA park, um then you know it looks up the call sign it looks up all the park info like when you work a park to park for example it fills that in uh so if you're connected to the internet right it populates all the fields otherwise you just type in what you need and um and it's all there and then there's an export adi and so when i'm done my activation I export it and then I post it on uh, the POTA website and poof, it's there. So it does POTA, SOTA, um, general logging, which is kind of, eh, it's kind of a half attempt at, you know, basic logging. Uh, it also does field day and winter field day. Excellent. Thanks for the recommendation. And, and I you can export. Free. Yeah. You can't beat the price. Okay. Thanks for that. I was looking for something like that as sort of the, the home base, uh, I, my mountaintop stuff is all just by hand, but when yeah. I come home, I, I have to enter it. And, and transcribe uh, it into that. I've done the same thing and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I don't know how long um, it's been out. I only discovered it probably, you know, three months ago and I won't use anything else. It's Thank not you. Free um, for iOS. Dan? For an iPad or, or iPhone version. Sorry, Peter. Um, yeah, I was going to mention that, Dan. And I was, uh, I had that loaded up about a year or two years ago, and I totally gave up on it. It was, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, I was watching the, of course, it was on the forum, and uh, it was broken. They broke the databases, people were losing stuff. It was an unmitigated freaking disaster for a lot of people. I, I, that, I have to say that. Uh, it was not a professional product, so. Um, but it's. But look at it now, the current version. And you know, I've been using it, like I said, now for several months, for several activations, twenty some odd activations, and it hasn't hiccuped on me once. It's been solid. So old version versus new version, I, I stand by my comments on the newest version. Okay. Uh, as being pretty reliable. Yeah, it's been. Yeah, it, 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 it and uh, its interface was kind of flaky. You'd click on it and you wouldn't get there or whatever. So, yeah, there's a couple of them. Um, and, and uh, another thing that should be mentioned, there's two or three very basic, uh, and I can get names for them if anybody wants them. Um, I'm not really into the POTA thing. So, there are a couple of really good basic logs for your cell phone that you can use and uh, and you can export the ADA files and uh, it makes it really, really easy for uh, to doing that. And there's also another program um, that's very good for just entering your logs by hand. And um, I can give you that name too. I forget what the heck that is right now, but if you've just got a whole bunch of paper logs and you need to type them in directly, um, that's really the kind of thing rather than trying to use N1MM or Logger32, that's nothing but a headache. So uh, uh, Jerry, I think back to you, you wanna do your next presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, any other comments regarding the logging before we move on? I was just, just gonna mention that uh, uh, 
now that we're talking WSJTX here, that that can be integrated into M1 in N1 MM2, and it's kind of a hassle to get it done, but it works. I haven't crossed that bridge yet because I don't uh, contest with uh, FT4, but a lot of people do. Let me ask, do most of these loggers let you record the mode, especially if you're using some sort of digital mode or say you're working through satellites or something like that? Yes. Let you, okay, record all that sort of stuff. Great. In, inside, for example, inside Logger 32, there's a, a band plan. And so you can specify what frequencies and what modes. And when it sees that frequency, and it instantly populates or uses that mode it assumes for example from 14.0 megahertz to 14.069 or something it might assume cw when, and then you can put a window in for uh, psk 31 and 070 to 071 and, and so on and you can do that all the way up to uh, vhf frequencies and you can use it for that as well and you can say in this range i'm i'm fm uh, blah 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 so um it will know by the frequency and then you can select um you can tell it when you uh, are on a certain frequency do you want to use the band plan or do you want to use the rig data because it will also depending how you connect it to a rig it will say okay i'm on this mode and now i'm going to use that mode as my uh to uh put that in the log and what if, say, I was making connections over Echolink where, you know, there might not be a radio involved on my side at all? Can it record something like that? That's a good question. I've never done Echolink, so I don't know how to answer that. I would think you could probably make comments or whatever, but there's no frequency. Like on QRZ, you just, I guess, log it as a digital voice. And Logger 32 won't uh, save a contact unless there is a frequency involved. You might, you might be able to uh, work around as you specify a frequency that you would never use for anything other than that, and then it knows right away. And then you put it on the band plan that that's uh, echo link. Sounds good. I'm sure there's a way of doing it. Okay, uh, let's, I've just got a few slides um, on some tips. Uh, I assume that uh, some people haven't run SJT WSJTX here, but I'm not going to give a tutorial on it. Uh, this is what we saw uh, in my last presentation with the integration in Logger 32. So let's zoom in a little bit. And I've got some tips along the side here. Um, I just moved the, the uh, waterfall uh, spectrum window down to the bottom here because of the space that I had to work with. And I wanted to make some points here, some things that people may not notice or have not noticed. Um, none of the fields in here are there for window dressing. Everything is very much used. There's no, no nothing here um, that's unnecessary. And so uh, you'll you'll see in the band activity all this scrolling through here, and then if you're actually uh, receiving somebody on the frequency, then it'll come through here. Um, the green bar on this um, display here is where you're receiving. And the red bar is where you're transmitting. And my, uh, my rule of thumb is they should never be the same, only in rare cases. And I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, it's important to know that your transmit frequency, and these I think are 50 hertz wide on FT8, and the whole band is three kilohertz wide. So your transmit is 2011. That's the, the left side of this bar. And you can see it's just past the 2000 tick mark. And your receive is 291. It's in here, and the left side of this tick bar would be at 291. So these are your two frequencies that you're working with. Now, why do I say you should never um, work? Like this little checkbox here, hold TX frequency, I always have it checked because if you don't, it will set the, the receive and transmit bars at the same point. You'll be using the same frequency, like simplex. And 
it comes as a default not to be checked. Well, if you click on a station you want to work, it's going to send your transmit frequency or set it to the exact same frequency as they're at. And a lot of people do that because they don't know any better. And so typically what, what would happen is if you're transmitting on their transmitting frequency, chances are somebody else is doing the same thing and you're competing with one or more stations trying to contact them on the same frequency that they're on. But what I try to do is I try to find gaps in this. Uh, these are all the signals that I'm picking up across the three kilohertz. I try to set my, my um, transmit frequency where I'm not hearing anybody. That's an open frequency. That gives, now I can't hear everybody, but that gives me the best chance that I can do of them hearing me rather than being interfered with by any one of these other stations. So uh, the way you do that is you hold the shift button down and then with your left mouse button, you click on the left side of where you want to be and it moves your red uh, bar here exactly into that position. Or if you knew you wanted to be at 2010, you could actually um, type it in here. You just highlight this number and you can type it in. Another thing that you can do is if uh, you see a, a station you want to work, scroll by, and you want to um, to work them, you can click on it. But if they've scrolled by too far or it keeps scrolling on you too fast, you can actually just type in, uh, if you notice their uh, receive, their frequency, you can just type it in here. And then next time it hears them, it decodes them, it'll show up in here. And then you can click on that and you're ready to work them. Um, another thing, if you're not familiar, if you click on the erase button once, it will erase all this information that you've been receiving and uh, you receive things. So if your green bar is listening, a guy over here, and you've been recording all this stuff, you want to clear it out, you hit erase, hit the button once. If you want to clear everything out, both windows, you hit it twice. So that's another thing. Um, if you've got your radio set up on 14 meters, let's say it was 14.2, you were doing some phone and now you decide to go work some FT8, the fastest way is to go click on the mode but, uh, menu button and then it'll drop down and show you possible modes. If you want to do FT8, just click FT8 and uh, it'll use the database that's internal, that's defaults, uh, and it'll go to 14.074 automatically rather than adjusting your rig or typing in the number or whatever. If you want to do FT4 mode, FT4, and it'll go to 14.080. So that's a quick way of moving around. Question on question on this, Jerry. Yeah. Um, it absolutely confounds me how you can get that um, spectrum going from 300 hertz to 3000 hertz. Now, uh, you're in logger 32, but I was just... Oh, no, no, WSGTX. I'm not. No, this is in WSGTX. And what you do, uh, I haven't shown it here and I don't have it live, but under controls in this window, there's a little underneath this green arrow, there's a box for controls. And you can specify the range 300 to 3000, whatever you want. Okay. I thought I tried that, but okay, we'll give it a try. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, and, and the other thing you have to do, I think there's another, um, it's been so long since I've done it, but there's another uh, parameter that something to do with the, uh, the step size, which you have to fool around with. Uh, there's a question, could I have used JT Alert? Yes, I haven't been using that lately. I did load it and looked at it a long time ago. Uh, but you, yeah, you can use that very, uh, it ties in very nicely with, uh, with WSJTX. Does anyone else want to make a comment on that? Um, I tried GT Alert and uh, Grid Tracker, and uh, I prefer Grid Tracker. Okay. I typically don't use either one, but uh, I have tried them at times, and I didn't find any additional functionality that I didn't already have when it was integrated with Logger 32. But if you don't have logger 32, yeah. integrated, then it's definitely one of those two should you should be looking at. I don't use any other login software, just uh, grid tracker and uh, that's 
uploads it to uh, uh, QRZ or um, LOTW. So. Yeah, uh, Grid Tracker has a number of uh, log upload capabilities, both to some online logging as well as uh, other local logging software. So it's got quite some configurability there. And then, of course, you can post to PSK Reporter and things like that. You can also, if you have ham clock, um, you can also send, like if you click on a station to work it, uh, so that it'll update your ham clock, you know, move the pin and then show you the, you know, uh, the path and all that sort of stuff to that other station. Right. Uh, another thing um, that you can do here is, and this is not too many people know, if you see a call sign or you're looking for somebody, you can actually type the call sign in, in this field here. You don't even need a grid square, but if you know it, you can type it in as well. And then you hit the button, generate standard messages, and you're ready to go talk to them. So right away, you, you don't even need to uh, uh, see who's on the band or whatever if, if your buddy's coming yeah, on. Yeah, that's exactly what I did for uh, the expedition. You just type it in, click All right. on your rate and <laughs> enable transmit. So Jerry, what about the tune button there? The tune actually just allows you to uh, see that you're talking to your transmitter and and also the power out you can adjust you have some control over the power uh as well now i was recently contacted by a ham in florida who said i was overdoing things a bit uh causing some harmonics um and he gave me some suggestions so i'll talk about that and he was absolutely right because I was wondering why they were picking me up on when I was doing FT4 on 20 meters. I was also being spotted on the FT8 frequency. So yeah, you uh, gotta watch that ALC uh, meter, right? You exactly. Know, and but there's a way of of actually helping that out, and I'll get into it real soon. Yeah, you know, I uh, settled on a DT gain on my ace would be three out of a hundred, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Setting up, I've just got a few uh, slides. One of the things I will say is make sure you type in your grid square correctly. I can't tell you how many times I've been excited for a new grid square and they've messed it up. They've, they've transposed uh, letters and numbers or whatever in there. So it, that's easy to do. Most of these things, the defaults are pretty good in the general uh, setup. Uh, when you go into uh, so, uh, selecting your, your rig, it's, of course, rig specific. Getting the right COM port is usually most of the battle and making sure that your baud rate is compatible with what your radio is set at. This is what I've been using for, for my radio. Now, when you're, I had this problem with the uh, harmonics or whatever that were being generated here, and the guy said one of the best ways to mitigate that is to use always use split operation and set it on rig. Uh, if your rig has VFO A and B, you can do this. And most modern rigs are, that people are using are, are well capable. And he said, what happens is the, the filtering that your rig will do, uh, this actually changes your transmit frequency uh, for VFO B. So you'll notice if you're at 14.074 for your receive, your transmit might be 14073, and then uh, it's actually um, compensating for that in the audio tone that it generates. So keep uh, keep this on split. He said that gets rid of most of the problem. And I heard him, uh, he heard me again. He said, your problem is gone once I went to, to uh, set this on, on uh, rig. It also makes it easier when you want to jump to uh, Fox Hound mode because it has to be split. It has to be split operation for it to work on Fox Hound. Gary, that might, that might be the reason why I got absolutely no success on FT8, even though I was putting out signals and calling guys at high signal levels and stuff like that and didn't, and my ALC was low and it did not work at all. Hmm. Well, I made, Thousands of contacts when I had it set to none, but probably not the best quality signal because I put out typically about 200 watts for DXing or whatever. 
Yeah. And yeah, Dan, uh, that's low compared to most people. I know it's supposed to be a low power mode. Um, oh, it's a weak signal mode, not low power, but it well, is a <laughs> full duty cycle mode. Yes. So, you know, if you have a 200 watt transmitter, it's it's running at 100% duty cycle. Right. It makes a lot of heat and so on. So. Exactly. You know. If you're running a uh, IC7300, they recommend about a 35% duty cycle which would give you about 35 watts out typically, something like that. Uh, I run mine into an amplifier. So I run about 10 watts into, a, or 12 watts into an amplifier that then puts out 200 watts, uh, which is uh, uh, not too bad, but uh, there are lots of people running kilowatts, I hate to say. Oh, I know. I saw a guy <laughs> was like point. Uh, or plus 28 dB. He was a W6 station. Yeah. And he was plus 26 on my waterfall. Yeah. And when, when Bud is on, who lives a few blocks from me, and he's on with uh, uh, 100 watts, he's plus 26 or, or so. <laughs> uh, yeah. So make sure you try that. If you have an old rig, you might have to use fake it, and that works. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and 15 watts, you, it's amazing what you can do with low power when the band's open and you don't have QRM. Uh, I have tried, I remember for, for weeks and weeks, I tried working uh, on 40 meters uh, into Indonesia because there were a bunch of grid squares I needed uh, for in the mornings on 40 meters, Indonesia's open, and they couldn't hear me with 200 watts. I could hear them, I don't know what they were running, and finally, I, one day I decided to go up to 400 watts, and it was the first time I worked these guys. So uh, weak signal, I don't know. They just, um, but I don't know what power they're running. But I normally don't run more than 200 watts. The last tab on here, advanced, this is where you get into the Fox Hound. So you check this box and make sure Hound is selected. And uh, everything else, I'm pretty much uh, leaving alone, the defaults. Uh, if you want to work contests or whatever, a field day, this is where you can do an ARRL field day or winter field day. You could possibly work that by putting these uh, exchanges in there. Um, but I, I am not a, a, a digital contester. I hardly have ever, in fact, I've never done a... a digital contest with Riddy or with um, FT4. Uh, another thing to note, uh, I like FT4 because it's, uh, it's faster, but it requires a stronger signal, but it will not work on uh, split mode. So only the FT8 will work on split. So you will not hear these guys on the D-Expedition running FT4 because they can't do split. Yeah, talking about the expedition, you have to also go to frequencies tab and change the frequencies to custom. That's one way of doing it. Or if you know, for example, instead of 1409.074, uh, they're on 14.105. Um, if you then go into the mode button and hit, once you uh, check this box and you go back to... Uh, to mode and you say FT8, it's going to send you back to 14074 because it doesn't know the special frequency is... is uh, uh, well, that's the whole, whole point, right? Like I, for example, I have two configurations, right? When you go to the configurations menu, yeah. you can actually have uh, custom settings uh, for frequencies and, and modes and, and whatnot, right? And then uh, once you select it, you know, like let's say I called it Bouvet, Right with my yeah. custom frequencies, I switch the configuration to it, and yeah. then I just select the band, and it sets the frequency for me automatically to what uh, they use there. Well, there I learned from you because what I've been doing is I would find out what the frequency is. I would go on Foxhound mode, and then I would uh, manually dial my radio to that frequency and copy VFOA to VFOB, and I'm ready to go. 
Well, I don't touch my radio at all, right? I just use the, the, the program. But anyway, if you have uh, the actual uh, program live instead of a PowerPoint, uh, that's probably would be easy to illustrate like what, yeah. how you play with configurations there. All right, there's a question uh, from Peter. What is uh, Foxhound mode? And so what, what uh, they're allowed, what you're allowed to do or the capability is the Fox, in this case, the D-Expedition, can talk to up to five different stations at the same time. And so what you would see is typically down at the bottom of this uh, display, usually they don't do more than three. I've seen four a few times. Um, you would see three of these bars, these vertical bars where they're transmitting uh, with a little bit of separation in between. So they're actually answering three different uh, stations simultaneously. So what they're doing is they're picking out in the, in the waterfall display three different stations. And what happens is when you're, in, you're the, the hound, let's say you're transmitting and you're saying uh, uh, their call sign and your call sign with your grid square like this, then they pick you and all of a sudden you see your red bar, your transmit, go down to one of these three uh, columns here. Their receive and trans, sorry, their transmit that is now uh, set. It actually brings you down to their frequency that they're transmitting on and you have uh, no control over that. And then uh, they give you the information you need uh, and they extract from you the information they need, the signal report, and then 7-3 and you're done. So it's a way of working multiple stations up to five simultaneously um, so that you can work big pileups more efficiently. Jerry, too bad you don't have my uh, email just sort of to show what started that all conversation. Actually, you know, that, okay. that screenshot. Have that. Hold on. Uh, this is what, you know, this morning I, um, uh, you know, I'm seeing everybody's uh, calling Bouvet, so I'm joining them, right? And all of a sudden I see uh, somebody calling me, but uh, the call, their call sign is a little strange. It's it's FOX HMD, <laughs> FOX HMD, FOX HMD, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So this is how I learned about uh, Fox Hound mode this morning. Yeah. Well, I don't know. To, honestly, I, I went and see what was wrong with the way I was transmitting, um, how it was obvious that I am not using that uh, Fox Hound mode, right? Like, uh, I could not tell. Yeah. Uh, and here's part of uh, the answer to Peter's question. Bins per pixel. That's the sort of the granularity and you start at this frequency and then you see how far it goes so you can get everything into the into the window you want. So you just have to play with that a little bit more, I think, and you'll you'll figure out your settings. And then oh, I also had a little FT4 um, here. This this thing changes to uh, FT4 instead of FT8. It shows you your current transmission, your last transmission, just like in FT8 it does. Um, and then uh, I'm calling here, my, my transmissions are in yellow and when he comes back to me, he's in red and then uh, it automatically logs in, uh, goes to my logger 32, it completes. And I, I worked a new, uh, this guy was a new grid square or uh, a new country for FT4 mode on uh on this band whatever it was uh um well that's not the right uh, here it is on 10 meters so that's it for uh for the ft8 it's already thanks jerry hope that helps to uh, give, give you a few tips on on working through it Jerry, a comment. Yeah. Uh, the Vox Hound thing on, if you can go back to that uh, screen that showed the uh, the uh, opening up the settings. There's a thing there that you have to set sometimes that's not um, 
It's one that says uh, receive goes or transmit receive goes back to the original frequency or something like that. Um, it's on the general tab, I think. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, down there towards the bottom, I think. Um, monitor returns to the last used frequency. You're supposed to set that for uh, Fox Sound. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, I've not set that, and I've worked a lot of Foxhound, but uh, I will. I, I now that you raise that point, I do recall seeing that in the instructions years ago. <laughs> That's where I saw it, and I reviewed it just before I went into this, uh, uh, trying to get a hold of the uh, Ove people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have that checked, then once they've worked you, there's no telling what frequency. Uh, you will end up on. They kind of throw you out. So if you want to go back to where you were originally, then have that box checked. Good point. Yeah, Jerry, I was able to, I just went into WSJTX. I was able to control, um, you know, kind of the, the the grid, the spacing across it. The unfortunate thing in, um, in WSJTX, this is not an N1MM, but if you resize the window, then you lose the, those frequencies. So basically uh you can't you know you can't really control the window size um independently it's kind of a bizarre thing yeah i i know exactly what you mean i struggle with that to get it just to where it was and then you you leave it hopefully that was uh of use to some of you